church. Amen. Amen. Is God good? Is God so incredibly good? I, I never cease to be amazed at God's providence, at his goodness, at his timing, at his will. Thank you, Chris, for priming the pump. Thank you for your obedience, brother. Wow, our God is awesome. Well, I could just stop and go home. Mm, but I think God's got a little bit more for us this morning. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share you with my brothers and sisters. And I just return to you all that you've given to me. My heart's desire is that you be glorified. Do according to your perfect will. Open our hearts. Open our ears and our minds. Open our arms that we might receive what you have for us today. And I'll thank you for that in the precious, precious name of my Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Church, the more I see darkness encroaching on our great nation, the more I'm stirred to pray. And, and as I pray, I, I hope that there are enough of us crying out to God to push back the darkness. There's a, a novel that um, my daughter calls her favorite book of all time. Um, and Madame Langle writes a story about this, this group of children that, that are called to intervene on behalf of planet Earth. And they are shown a black cloud that is encroaching upon planet Earth. And it, they are tasked with the responsibility to, to fight against that darkness. And I don't know that the author of that book knew she was prophetic, but we have seen over the last decades, decades now for those of us who are a little bit older, this darkness encroaching. And it's on us, church, to push back. And there's no greater way for us to push back than through prayer. And when I turn to prayer, my thoughts automatically turn to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And I want to talk to you this morning about your Christian life. More specifically, I want to ask you once again to examine your faith. If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, we'll see Paul's exhortation to Christians, and it's to you and I, brothers and sisters, as much as it was to them. Test and evaluate yourselves to see whether you're in the faith and you're living a life that's committed. We need to be examining ourselves. And, and the central question I'm asking this morning is, what are you aiming for? In the lives that we have and the years that each, have been, each of us have been given, my question to every one of you is, what are you aiming for? Most of us have heard the saying that those who fail to plan, plan to fail. And I'm not so certain that I believe that in its entirety, but I think the statement has some merit. And I think the lesson for you and I, church, is that we need to be certain that we're aiming at the right target. That what we're looking for is the right thing. And when we think about significant things in our lives, and maybe even some of the lesser significant things, we can always pause to consider our actions. Whether it's hunting, hunting, where you're literally aiming at something, or whether it's a sport or a craft or a career, most of our activities have a goal. So again, now whether you're aiming for a trophy buck or the end zone or a perfect result in a craft, there's typically an aim and a target that you focus for. Now taking that same thinking 
I want to ask that question about our spiritual life again. What are you aiming for? And I'm not looking for the trite answers that I know all of us can supply. I'm challenging us to pause for a moment this morning and consider not only what we're aiming for, but church, how true is your aim? How accurate is your aim? I could bring a, a hunter or an athlete or a crafter up front this morning, and I could um, tell you or ask them to tell you, and they could spout off a bunch of things that are very specific to their chosen activity. And with that same vein, I want to look at the spirit part of our life. And I want to say, what are we doing? What are we doing with the time that we're given? When we confess that we're pursuing Christ as our chief aim, then we've got our primary target. If I'm all about Christ, then my life should represent that I'm going at that target. The Protestant reformers of the 16th century believed in the aim of the Christian life was to live according to the called Coram Deo. And Coram Deo is a Latin phrase that conveys the idea that being a Christian means living our entire life in the presence of God. In the presence of God, church. Clothed in his righteousness, we stand holy and blameless in his presence. And we gratefully live in a manner that pleases him. Living our lives in faith and repentance and trusting him every moment. In other words, it's another way of saying living a life that is obedient to Christ. He said if we love him, we'll keep his commands. That's something, church, that's worthy to aim for, to keep his commands. As I said before, those aiming at something have a target, and I want to start as a basis, an essential statement. Being a Christian is not something we do. Being a Christian is something that we are. I am a follower of Christ. I am a believer. I am a churchgoer. I am, but those ams dictate what I do with the rest of the week. That's what we're supposed to do. Now let's go deeper. Where do you start? Where do you start? A hunter gets a hunting guidebook. What do we get? We get the word. You know, church, other than prayer, the word is the one thing that we have from God that serves as a guide is how we got to live. And if we're going to follow Christ, then we got to know the guidebook. We've got to know the word. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind and keep focused habitually on the things above, not on the things here on earth. And I think before we dive too quickly in the deep end here, we need to clarify up front the if. It's our answer to the if that makes a difference. An athlete who's playing recreational football has a whole different focus than a serious athlete who's, who's going at it to aim professional. My youngest brother was a hunter. And my goodness, that guy made a science out of hunting. Every autumn, his life was committed for a period of time just, just to getting ready to hunt. It was the clothes. It was the scents. It was, the, it was targeting out the area. It was looking at his, at his bow and his arrow, getting everything lined up. Now, a Christian who's answered the if question, who says, yes, if you've been raised with Christ, and you can say, yes, yes, I've been raised with Christ. If you come to understand fully the high price paid for your salvation, that'll be our intent. It'll be running as a thread through everything that we do, whether it's our recreation or our career, or our just daily living activities. If you've been raised with Christ, that'll weave right on through it. Theologian and author Tim Keller says, it's impossible to meet the real Jesus and leave indifferent. That's truth, brothers and sisters. That's having a target. And it begs us to ask the question, who is Jesus to me. Who is he? Is he a God? Is he a force? 
Is he a person? Is he somewhere out there? Or is he my Lord? Is he my Jesus? Is he my Savior? Because if he's mine, he'll be an essential part of every facet of my life. I look at Anna and Jacob, newly married couple. He's my husband. He's mine, ladies. Step back, yeah? Yeah. You know the mindset. Devotion, commitment, faithfulness. The rest of us been married years are still there. Devotion, faithfulness, commitment. Now, what about your walk with your Savior? Is he a Wednesday, Sunday kind of guy? Do you date him? Or is he every part of your life, church? Who's Jesus to me? You know, we've got a target, and now we set our sights. And I did a little bit of research. I'm not a hunter, and I'm not good with guns. So I had to check and see, what about sights? What are they there for? Well, sights help you pinpoint and to make sure that your aim is true. If your sights are off, chances are you're going to miss the target. So let's look at our sights. For those of us who have encountered Jesus, let's go back to Colossians again and look at the word keep. In Colossians chapter 3, 1 and 2, look at the word keep. It's here a couple different times. And you can see the implications there. Keep seeking. Keep focused. Don't do it one time, but make a habit of it. Keep doing it. You see his implication? Keep it. Keep going. Keep going. Do you understand? It's an action that's continual. It's not a one-time deal. It's not meet me at the altar and get up and do whatever from there on out. It's not that at all. Keep seeking the things that are above. Keep focus habitually on the place where your Savior sits. Jesus Christ is in heaven, seated at the right hand of God, and that's where our focus should be. And then there's the word habitually. Isn't that instructing us to make a habit of keeping our focus on those things that are above and not the things of the earth? Last week when he was speaking, Pastor talked to us and said, we need to learn to look at things from a heavenly or a spiritual frame. We don't look at the world through a Christian frame. We've got to put Christ right here and see everything through him, not the other way around. To pursue Christ's church, we need to set our sights on where he is. And where is he? He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And we need to keep reminding ourselves and refocusing on the things of heaven until it becomes second nature to us. How many are familiar with the phrase muscle memory? Muscle memory. How do you get muscle memory? Doing it over and over and over. Repetition until you've got it, until it comes a point where you don't even think about it. You just do it. That's what we need, church. We need to get to a place where we habitually keep our focus on Jesus Christ. And he's in every part, every facet of our life until it just becomes second nature. You do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you do it, and you remind yourself, go back, go back, go back until you've got it. We need to teach ourselves to make a habit of seeing the things on earth through that heavenly frame. And it's easy. It's just so easy with our earthly mindset to react and respond to the world. Why? Because it's right here present in front of us. It's screaming at us live with bright lights flashing all of our waking hours. Our technology has advanced so much that it's hard to escape it. When I was hearing Thomas talk about going to the camp, you unplug them from their media? Who boys? That's awesome. Take them away from their phone for two and a half days. What a blessing. Amen. You can have that time to rewire these kids. That should make us, church, want to make sure the target he's setting, those kids get to camp. That every young person in this church gets to camp. Phones left behind, unplugged, hearing nothing but godly men and women speaking truth into their lives. That's what we need. Despite the fact that the earth's screaming out, we need to keep in mind Paul's instructions. 
and then we add to it a favorite phrase, our a favorite passage that I've mine. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3 through 5. Look at that and see what it says. We're taking every thought captive. Every thought. The way to build a habit is to set your mind on something, to continually redirect our mind, and as Paul teaches, give him a second to get it, as Paul teaches, we're taking every thought and every purpose and every intention captive. We walk in the flesh. We're not fighting according to the flesh. Our weapons aren't, aren't carnal. They're not of flesh. They're mighty of God and pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Which thoughts, church? Which thoughts are we taking captive? Every thought, everything that comes at you comes from somewhere and capturing every one of them. And once we've captured them, what do we do with them? Okay, I've captured that thought here. During worship, I was delighted to see Chris come up and or ask, ask Lionel to come up and pray. He sensed that there was a heaviness here that was breaking, stopping us from breaking through. Thank you, brother, for your prayer. Thank you for your obedience. But we take those thoughts captive. What do we do with them? I've captured it. What does it say we're supposed to do? Examine them. To examine those thoughts. And then what? Then what do we do to them? Bring our thoughts, our purposes, our intentions into obedience to Christ. If it doesn't line up with what you know in Scripture, with what you've been taught about with Christ, if it doesn't match up, what do you do with it? You cast it away from you. You step on it. You stomp on it. You cast it out and say, be gone. I think the word used, move on. Move on. Destroy it. Destroy those things that try to get in. And they will, church. They will try to get in. And Satan is not a fool. He's a fool in re rebelling against God. But he's a mighty warrior to stand in opposition to us. And he's not stupid and he studies us to know where our weak spots are. Amen. All he needs, church, is a crack to get in. It's on you and I to be constantly in relationship to God, constantly in connection to him, constantly in communion, so we can capture those thoughts. One might slip in, but I can capture it. The minute I recognize it's there, I have the ability in Christ to capture that thought. Put it in a trap. Capture it. Examine it and cast it aside. You have no place here. Amen. Be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember earlier I shared with the Protestant reformers, if we love him, we'll keep his commands. And he's saying, bring it captive, make it obedient to Christ. Look at John 14, 15. He talks about this here, and you won't see it on the screen, but in my Bible, those are red letter words. What do red letter words mean? Jesus spoke those words, and what does he say? If you really love me, you'll keep and obey my commands. Let's talk about developing habits. It's not always easy. It's not always easy. And, and I've learned that it's not so much about avoiding those bad things. It's not about avoiding those things that aren't in our best interest. It's about replacing them with better things, more valuable things. So I don't want these thoughts to rule my life. If I, if I just kick them out, I've created a vacuum. And there's a phrase that says, nature abhors a vacuum. And I think it's true. And we know it because Jesus talked about it in, in his teachings when he said, <clears throat> excuse me, the woman who swept the house clean, she kicked the demon out. And she left it vacant. What happened? It says it came back with seven more like it. Much worse than it was. So we don't want to just kick out those bad things. We want to replace them with valuable things. We want to start planting the word in our heart, in our mind, in our life so that we can live by those things. Turn with me now to Philippians 4.8. And here's a purpose worth pursuing if we want to find success 
inner aim to, to obey and to glorify the Lord. Finally, believers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable and worthy of respect, whatever is right and confirmed by God's word, whatever is pure and wholesome, whatever is lovely and brings peace, whatever is admirable and of good repute, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think continually, habitually on these things. Center your mind on them and implant them in your heart. There's the lifestyle change. There's the purpose worth living for. If you want to get through those obstacles, because I'll guarantee you, when you decide, I'm going to capture my thoughts and I'm going to kick them aside, you're in, you're, you're in for a battle. Because what's going to happen is the enemy's going to come at you harder and faster and bam, 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 bam. They're coming. And you're capturing, 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 kicking them out. But we've got to replace them. We've got to replace them. It says we were taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So as we overcome the obstacles, we battle our flesh, as we battle the enemy of our souls, we purpose to build a new habit. We purpose to replace the negative with the positive. We'd be wise to commit these eight things to memory so that in difficult times when our thoughts start to get murky and muddled and we get confused, and I'll guarantee you when the enemy comes at an attack, there will be times where you feel confused. It's coming so hard and so fast. It's like, what do I believe? What do I listen to? Go back to the basics. Get these eight things. Capture those thoughts. Assess them against those eight character traits. A thought comes. Is it true? Is it? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? Is it of good report? Is it excellent? Is it praiseworthy? And every time you say no, gone. Be gone. Move on. You've got no place to be destroyed. Those are to be destroyed. They're not to be allowed to get to our soul. Amen. They're not to be allowed to get to our mind or to our heart. They're to be destroyed, cast them aside, step on them, reject them. I, I don't care how you use it, what verbiage you use, but get out. Amen. Get out. You have no authority here. Get out. I'm choosing Jesus. Amen. I've chose him. I'm choosing his way. I'm choosing that which is pure and wholesome and lovely and brings peace, admirable, good report, on and on. You want a shortcut to that? Try this. Ask, what would Jesus do if that thought came into his head? That'll clear the murkiness. What would Jesus do with it? And we can take comfort that Jesus loving us so much said, I'll never leave you an orphan. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to leave with you a helper. Turn to John chapter 16, verse 13. And Jesus said, I'm going to send you a helper. And what does that helper do? He guides us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will remain with us. And he will guide us. He will lead us. He will direct us into his truth. We have no reason to say, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've got the Holy Spirit walking right alongside you to help you, to help you discern what's right from wrong, what's pure from impure, what's lovely versus unlovely. There's somebody there at all times to point you in the way of truth. Our job, church, is to respond. Our job is to yield and submit and to listen to what he's saying and do it. I don't know about you, but I've, I've heard, there have been times in my life where I hear a voice, and it's not an out loud voice, but I hear the Holy Spirit saying, leave it. Walk away. Drop it. Sounds like it's talking to puppy dog, doesn't it? <laughs> leave it. That's not for you. And it's ours to decide what to do with that. Don't want to listen to that voice. I might be really angry or frustrated, and I'm here and leave it. And I gotta grip my teeth a bit and unclench my fists and turn and walk away. It's not easy. We walk in the flesh. 
But when I hear what I sense to be the Holy Spirit, my heart's desire is to drop it and walk away. We know the results of disobedience, don't we? It's rarely fun, but it's always for our good. All praise, glory, and honor be to God the Father. He has given us everything we need. And we don't have to try and pull it from ourselves because the fact is because we are sinful flesh, it's not in there. It's not in there unless Holy Spirit is there. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter was teaching the, the believers, and, and these are people who have been dispersed because of the oppression they were going against. He said, for his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life and godliness through, through true and personal knowledge of him, Jesus, who called us by his own glory and excellence. Wow. God has given us everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life through knowing Jesus. Church, not a few things. Not some things. Not an assortment of things. All things. All things. Absolutely everything that you need is there. All it takes is you and I saying, help Help. Chris, you want to come, please? Church, God hasn't left us stranded. And he's not left us alone to find our own way. He's given us a clear picture. He's given us everything we need to keep our aim true and to keep our, si our sights lined up so we got the target right in the way. The choice is always ours. It's always ours. And I'm confident with everything in me that everybody within the sound of my voice this morning has everything that you need to reach the goal. That's the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Not one of us is short of that if we know him. We get to do it one choice, one thought, one decision at a time. It takes setting our minds and our intent on the one true goal and to keep walking, keep walking, keep walking. When we fall, we get up. Keep walking. When we take a sideways step or a detour or a backward step, we start again. And if we're wise, we keep our hand in the sure hand of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who's going to ensure that we get home in time for dinner. And I'm waiting for that great dinner. And that dinner won't start before all those designed to be there are there. I want to share one verse, one final verse this morning with you. In Psalm 73, my challenge to you is make this your confession. Whom have I in heaven but you? You, Jesus. And besides you, there's none upon the earth that I desire. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God, but God, he's the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let that be your confession, church. Let that be your confession. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if there's anybody here this morning who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't know my Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. If you don't, I would love to introduce you to him. Start you on a walk that'll be unlike anything you've ever experienced. So if there's anybody here who has that need, just wave at me. And we'll get some folks to pray with you this morning. Aside from that, church, if you came in this morning with a burden, and what I've learned in my life is that there's nothing too insignificant to talk to God about. I have prayed about some silly things in my life. I've prayed over lawnmowers. I've prayed over tire lug nuts. I've prayed over people. I've prayed over a lot of things. And God has never failed. He may not always answer the way I want, but God has never failed to provide an answer. So if you came in this morning with anything, however big, however small, please don't leave. Don't go out those doors or that door carrying it. Bring it to the Lord. I have brothers and sisters here who will gladly join us in prayer. So if you've got a need of any kind this morning, I invite you now just to come. I'll give you just a few moments to come.
share a song with you this morning. Gotta be on the other side of this place I'm standing in. Gotta be on the other side of this plane I'm living in. Gotta be on the other side of this world I'm striving through. Gotta be on the other side where I meet up with you. All I'm doing right now is trying to see what's true. All I'm doing right now is searching hard for you. Gotta be on the other side of all this unbelief. Gotta be on the other side where I know I can be free. Gotta be on the other side of this world of fear and lies. Gotta be on the other side of everyone's disguise. All I'm doing right now, I'm giving in. 